All right, let's get started. I'd like to welcome you all to our book launch and webinar on women policy and political leadership sponsored by the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia and the Conrad Adenauer Foundation in Singapore. I'm Farida Jalalzai. I'm a professor of political science and the Associate Dean of Global Initiatives and Engagement at Virginia Tech. We have an amazing group of scholars and politicians who are joining us from all over the world and we're navigating several time zones. First, I'd like to offer a little bit of background about our webinar topic and our edited collection. While women's presence in parliament has largely increased around the world, full gender parity still remains elusive. Women's participation in politics and their, their secure access to political life is vital for democratic development and sustainability. This panel, panel showcases a new edited collection that brings together regional perspectives to address the role of women parliamentarians around the world. The panelists or some of the panelists who contributed chapters to the edited collection are here today to discuss women's progress in the regions of Latin America and Asia. And what they'll do is they'll share their insights into how various forms of policy adoptions, including quotas, have shaped women's access to power, how women's political status in their regions has changed over time, and also suggest to us what remains to be done for women to gain full political empowerment. Our panelists, will then be followed by representatives from the Asian Democratic Leaders Alliance, who will also provide their insights into their own political careers as women. And at that point, we will open it up to your questions. Um, and so you can submit your questions via the chat box and, and we'll try to be able to reserve about 15 minutes or so at the end of the webinar to address your questions. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Christian Eschle, one of the co-editors of the volume, and he's also the director of the regional program in Political Dialogue Asia for the Conrad Adenauer Foundation in Singapore. Thank you so much, Dr. Jalasai. And it's indeed a big pleasure for me to welcome all of you on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and its Political Dialogue Asia, which is based in Singapore, where it's uh, 10 o'clock at night. So good morning to you in the US who are following us in the US and a good evening to those of you who are following us in Asia. It is my pleasure to do the official North America launch uh, of our second edition um, of the publication Women, Policy and Political Leadership. Um, the first edition of this book was published by us in 2015. And um, the motivation for Konrad Adenauer Foundation to engage in research in this area is quite clear. We are a German political foundation um, taking care of democracy and fostering democracies around the world. And yes, our US office had uh, a lot to do in the last four years. But um, in Asia, I think some of the um, issues um, that we are seeing when it comes to the weakness of democracy are obviously more prevalent. And among this is uh, the fact that too few women are presented in parliament. So this is a bigger part of our work in Asia, and um, it consists of a network of female parliamentarians, the Asian Women Parliamentarian Caucus. Um, but it also goes down to our Konrad Adenauer School for Young Politicians, where we are um, where we are making sure that both young men and young women um, are skilled and equipped um, in order to become responsive and um, respected leaders, political leaders um, in their countries. And it's really wonderful to see that tonight we have three um, of our uh, Kasip alumni with us. Um, once they went through the school, they become net, uh, members of the network Asian Democratic Leaders Association. And um, so uh, these are the three um, colleagues that will talk to us a little later. But before that, um, we will obviously hear about the fun 
findings of the second edition and we felt that after five years it is a good idea to do an update of the book we were very happy to see that all of the scholars were very happy to get involved in this project again after five years and of course if you look at the numbers if you look at the general trend you can say that we are moving into the right direction even if it's a slow movement uh, but we see that the numbers uh, in the parliaments are going up in general but obviously if you look closer at the question of women representation in the parliaments we see that there's still a lot of issues uh, to overcome just to name a few, and as I said, uh, I think we will uh, learn about this in much more detail in a moment, but um, I think we still can say that parliaments are sometimes a hostile environment for female parliamentarians. Um, this is at least uh, based on some of the stories that are also shared with us on the platform of AWPC. Um, we see that in some countries, the numbers are still very, very low, um, one digit percentage below 10%. Um, of the parliamentarians are women. So uh, even if most of the countries are picking up, some countries are really um, left behind when it comes to female representation. We still see that women are not um, active in all areas of politics. Um, at least the majority of women is often pushed or focusing on, on questions of family, of youth, of sports, so the softer topics, not so often finance and defense. Um, and I think this uh, is also something that we have to continue um, to work on. Of course, quota is a big topic in this context, and it is discussed throughout the book. And I'm sure we will also uh, learn a little bit more about quota in our discussion today. With this very rough overview, uh, I would like to end my uh, introduction of the book um, and would like to start the sharing of the screen. Uh, which will then allow you to download the book, the second edition of Women, Policy and Political Leadership, Regional Perspectives. Even if it is a project that was started in Asia, this is really a, a global effort, a, a global overview. And if you point your cameras now towards the QR code, you will be able to immediately download the digital version of this publication from our website. I hope you will enjoy the read. And I would like to thank um, Dr. Jalasai from the uh, College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences at Virginia Tech for enabling us to talk to an audience in the US uh, today. We, we are using the opportunity of Zoom to uh, do a little bit of a world tour with this book, uh, several book launches. Uh, so today it's really great uh, that through your organization we are able um, to do this in the US. And um, I would also, of course, like to thank our authors um, who will uh, share their insights uh, today. It's been really wonderful to work with you on this publication. And last but not least, I would like to thank my team, uh, in particular Mega Sama, who will also have a role in the program later on, um, who put a lot of work into um, this publication. And I think the outcome is really fantastic. So thank you very much uh, for being with us today. And I wish us all an insightful and interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to the panelists who contributed chapters to the volume. Dr. Bridget Welsh is, is currently Honorary Research Associate with the University of Nottingham Asia Research Institute, Malaysia. She's also a Senior Research Associate of the Hu Feng Center for East Asia Democratic Studies of National Taiwan University and a Senior Associate Fellow of the Habibi Center. She specializes in Southeast Asian politics with a focus on Malaysia, Myanmar, Singapore, and Indonesia. We also have with us Dr. Young M. Lee, who is an assistant professor of political science at Sacramento State University in California in the United States. And her main research areas are gender, legislative elections in South Korea, and gender and executive leadership in South Korea and Taiwan. And Dr. Jennifer Piscopo is an associate professor of political science at Occidental College in California. Her research focuses on representation, 
gender quotas, and legislative institutions in Latin America. All of our panelists are very well published in their areas of expertise. They publish in some of the top journals in their fields, and thus why they were asked to contribute chapters and, and be here today. That's my way of saying I can't talk about all of your great accomplishments because we simply don't have time, but these are amazing scholars. What I've done is I've asked each of them to briefly, in about five minutes, discuss some of the main trends that they detected regarding women's incorporation in the parliament in their regional area of expertise over the last decades. And I'd like to start with Dr. Welsh. Good evening from Malaysia, or good morning to those of you in other zones. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you and to talk to you about what's happening in the context of Southeast Asia. For those of you who are not as familiar with Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia, when I refer to it, speaks to the idea of 11 countries, which is largely the largest country in it is Indonesia um, in terms of population, but it also includes most of the, all the other ASEAN members, as well as East Timor. And it's comprised of over 640 million people, which is larger than the European Union. Uh, and it has it is a, a very important region because of its diverse political uh, landscape, and of course, the critical role that women play within it. We see a situation in terms of female representation where we've generally seen a plateau. Christian was talking earlier about mo modest gains, and Southeast Asia is not one of those areas that you would look at. It actually seems to be leveling off, um, it, but there are some conflicting trends. We see in the areas of executive participation, uh, we have some uh, move away from the tradition areas of women's work. Um, there's new, new, more women are taking on different ministries such as uh, uh, defense, uh, foreign affairs, um, and there actually have been some greater diversification of women in executive positions, but really their share is still considerably modest. In the area of the legislature, we've seen that in the last five years that uh, Southeast Asia is only slightly above the global average and there's considerable diversity within Southeast Asian countries. So countries such as uh, Thailand has very low participation of women, while a country like Timor-Leste, which has a very strict enforcement of quotas, has a very high level of but we also see it's sort of those conflicting trends, um, more rise of, of ordinary women, everyday women in terms of the political participation. Uh, uh, considerable levels of women in Southeast Asia vote, and there's now been greater participation in pol political life. And the gender gap in many countries in the region is narrowing, particularly in places such as Singapore and the Philippines. Now, we have to ask ourselves, what is it about Southeast Asia that's somewhat different? Well, there, and what is the same as what with the trends that we see in the rest of the world? Well, in the context of Southeast Asia, we only have a few countries that have quotas. And so quotas ha have been a driver, but they haven't necessarily been uh, the key feature that is affecting the dynamic in the region, except, of course, with the lack of quotas in most of the countries. What we do see, however, is the real uh, challenge of cultural norms in Southeast Asian societies. So data that I point to in the chapter in a place like Indonesia shows that almost 40% of the public don't think that women should have the same role as men in political life. And that's a lot of people, especially in what is considered to be one of the largest democracies in the world. Um, we also see similarly that in the area of Vietnam, a quarter of the population have a sense of norms about participation that is actually quite negative. The real big obstacle for many Southeast Asian countries is our political parties themselves and the patriarchy that exists within these political parties. Uh, they have actually prevented women and compartmentalized them. Uh, so as a consequence, women are not able to rise through the ranks of political parties and participate. Uh, and we still have the pattern uh, that exists of political dynasties of daughters and wives. Uh, some of that has become inculcated in places where, for example, like the Philippines, to keep family dynasties, you have a situation where women are actually become uh, the third turn, take over the role of their husbands and then turn it back to their husbands or to another family member. So what we have is a situation, uh, we still have these old traditional norms and patterns for women in politics. Increasingly, we've seen two very important drivers that help us to understand the plateau of late. 
One, of course, has been the political polarization that we see across the world. Um, but this has affected and empowered um, different, different ideological norms, which really challenge women. And in part of that populist kind of element that have fed into polarization has involved the rise of dirty politics in places such as the Philippines. Um, with such a, under Duterte's presidency, there's been attacks on women. And this, of course, has narrowed the space for with female participation. Another important um, driver of change has been the role that women uh, play in politics. That business has been driven, politics has been driven by business and as a con and the business interests. So this has been, has in some ways displaced women play, where they have had very traditional, powerful roles in politics, such as places like Vietnam. So, we see a situation that is somewhat worrying for a region that is very dynamic. There have been modest shifts uh, in participation. Most of these are happening, uh, being carved out at below, not within the political system as a whole. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And we will now move to Dr. Lee. Let me share uh, my screen. Can you see? Yes, okay. Okay, thank you so much. So I'll focus on the main trends of women's numerical representation in the parliaments in three countries in Northeast Asia, namely South Korea, Taiwan, and Japan, based on the chapter I contributed um, to the book. So here is a graph showing the share of women in the national parliaments in those three countries between 1999 and 2020. So this line indicates uh, Taiwan, and the second one is for South Korea, and the third one is for Japan. So for the two decades, Taiwan consistently has shown the highest level of women's representation in the parliament among the three. And as of January 2021, 42% of national parliamentarians are women in Taiwan, which would have ranked Taiwan as the 22nd um, highest in the world if interparliamentary union were to count Taiwan as a country. And its democratic neighbor, South Korea, um, women assume only 19% of the National Assembly seats, which is slightly lower than the regional average, like Asia's average of 21%. And Japan is even lower, uh, which is 10%, and I rounded up. <laughs> so it was slightly lower than 10%. And this, this level of women's representation is in stark contrast to, uh, to South Korea and Japan's economic development, considering the fact that Japan's GDP gross uh, domestic uh, product, uh, product is in, in 2019 was the third highest in the world and South Korea's was the 12th um, um, highest in the world. So however, in all those three countries, Women's representation has grown over time, however, slowly. And as you can see here in South Korea's graph, the share of women has um, doubled in 2004, which is a generous term because we are talking about 6% to 13% um, uh, increase. Still, this increase was possible um, due to the electoral system change and the adoption of gender quotas in 2004, which leads to my next point. So all the three countries use mixed electoral system, which means some of the members of parliament are elected by the first past the post system. Whoever has the highest number of votes is going to be the winner in their district. And the remaining seats are distributed uh, proportional to each party's vote share. And therefore the national tier seat. So for the PR seats, political parties have um, select and rank their candidates before the election. So as you can see in this table, uh, PR tier tends to elect more women than the district tier seats, as political parties have an incentive to diversify and create more inclusive slate of candidates, such as prominent disability activists or labor union activists, you know, feminist movements, or even youth representatives. Um, so as you can see here, Taiwan and South Korea has adopted gender quotas in its current form 
in 2005 and 2004, respectively. And uh, Taiwanese feminists led an effort to expand the gender quota inspired by the UN's Beijing uh, Conference in, 2000, uh, in 1995. Um, and Japan has not enacted any gender quotas in the national um, government yet, even though in 2016, four opposition parties submitted a bill proposing gender quotas, but it did not get enough support. Um, one last thing to note is in Taiwan, a lot of women who served at the local level they could be successfully getting elected at the national level, which didn't really happen in South Korea. But in both Taiwan and South Korea, there was limited inter-tier um, upward mobility. Those who served for the PR seats, they rarely are, are successful at winning national um, district level election seats. So some it suggests limited inter-tier um, spillover effect of gender quotas. So I'm going to um, stop here. Thank you, Young. Dr. Lee. And next we'll move to Dr. Piscopo. <clears throat> Hi, good, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> good morning and good evening. Thank you so much for inviting me um, to join you this morning. As I go ahead and, and share my screen, I just want to give um, advanced apologies that I'll have to leave the webinar a little bit early. Um, probably you're not as in, following along eagerly as I am with Latin American politics, uh, but Chile is about to um, have elections for what will be the world's first constitutional convention seated with gender parity, half men and half women. So I actually have to go to another event to talk about Chile's constitutional convention. Um, but I, so my apologies in advance and I really, um, my contact information is here and I encourage everyone if you have further questions to reach out to me via email. So I'm going to give a brief rapid fire tour of women in politics in Latin America. So Latin America democratized about in the 1980s, different countries democratized um, at different moments for different reasons, but overall the, the Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries of the region moved towards democracy in the 1980s. And women played significant roles in the pro-democracy movements and the human rights movements and the activist movements that toppled dictators and ended civil wars but only about 5% of women were elected in the founding democratic elections. And these results were thought to be quite disappointing given the active role that women had played in the democratization process. So in response, women activists pushed for gender quotas and Argentina became the first country in the world to adopt gender quotas in 1991. So the effects of gender quotas in Latin America have been fairly astounding. They've raised the proportion of women in Latin America's lower or unicameral chambers from about 9% in 1990 to 30% today. Um, today, there are quota laws everywhere. Um, the only two countries in the region without quota laws are Venezuela and Guatemala. 10 of these quota laws are set at gender parity and five countries have achieved gender parity or near gender parity in their legislatures. Mexico, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Costa Rica. One thing that the gender quotas have done has helped normalize women's political power in the region. So Latin America has had five popularly elected female presidents since 1999. You see here Maria Moscoso in Panama, Michelle Bachelet in Chile, who served two terms, Cristina Fernandez in Argentina, who served two terms, Laura Chinchilla in Costa Rica, where um, Costa Rican presidents can only serve one term, and Dilma Rousseff, who was re-elected for her second term in Brazil. Um, in terms of women in the executive branch, right now there are about 30% women ministers in the region. And again, we see a trend towards gender parity cabinets. So women are 40% or more of cabinets in Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Colombia, and Mexico. What's interesting here is that uh, countries that have gender parity in the legislature are not necessarily the same countries that have gender parity in cabinets. There's some overlap, as with Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Mexico, but there's also some cases where women's representation in the legislature is quite low and countries are compensating um, by appointing more women to cabinet. There's also women's increasing presence in the hard cabinet portfolios, the more prestigious ones. Those are security, defense, justice, and the economy. 
In terms of the policy gains, I put a photo here of Bolivia's majority female Congress. Bolivia is one of two countries in the world alongside Rwanda to actually elect more women to Congress than men. Um, one thing that electing more women in Latin America has done has made these quota laws stronger. We see women willing to work across party uh, lines in order to improve quota laws and elect more women. We see the adoption of strong laws to prevent violence against women. That doesn't mean the laws are always implemented, but on paper, they actually look quite good. And we see women working on other initiatives to expand women's access to reproductive health care, to offer domestic workers more protections, and to um, deal with the unequal balance of labor in the care economy. So finally, some recommendations to continue strengthening women's policy power, not just in Latin America, but in other world regions. What my research has shown makes a difference. The first is the presence of committees in the legislature or the parliament that have the ability to review, introduce, and forward advance legislation on gender equality and women's issues. So having a dedicated parliamentary committee to gender equality not to women, children, and family, but to gender equality provides a platform for women legislators to influence lawmaking. Um, the second is women's caucuses. So these are informal organizations that can help women parliamentarians network, gain professional experience, make connections, and strategize about policy um, proposals. Uh, third, the importance of networks and partnerships, not just among women in the parliament, which we see through caucuses and standing committees, but between women in the parliament and civil society. And I put here an example from Mexico where women legislators work very closely with women activists, women journalists, um, women in the electoral authorities to ensure that quota laws are implemented fairly and to really use the press and social media strategically for goals related to advancing women's political rights. And then finally, an innovation from Latin America that's also used elsewhere are these policy observatories. And I put here an example of the observatory of the law to eradicate gender-based violence in Ecuador. And these are a type of networks and partnerships between women legislators, women in the executive branch, and women in civil society, but they're organized around monitoring the implementation of particular women's rights laws. And again, using the media, um, using social media to track government's progress and not just passing the law, but actually making sure that it's implemented. So that was uh, very rapid, but thank you for your attention. And again, please feel free to reach out to me via email or social media. Thank you, Dr. Piscopo. So what we're going to do at this point is I have a few questions that I'm going to have the panelists try to address. Um, and so when um, we're thinking about uh, some of the main obstacles that have traditionally faced, have been faced by women in pursuing political careers in the specific regions that you guys, that you are studying, what comes to mind? Um, and I guess let perhaps um, we get started with um, this question with Dr. Welsh. Sorry about that. Um, I think that what we are seeing in the context of Southeast Asia are some very interesting trends. Um, uh, one of the things is, is that women themselves are often an obstacle for women rising. In fact, we see disproportionately women not wanting to support women candidates and also uh, leading the voices on some of the calls for issues of gender equality uh, in terms of uh, opposing them. We also know from the discussion with political candidates um, that uh, besides dealing with political parties, which I've spoken about earlier, uh, women candidates disproportionately face problems of, of financing in campaigns uh, and are often uh, slated against other women candidates disproportionately. These are trends we see globally, but in particular, we see this in quite a few countries in, in Southeast Asia, uh, for example, in Malaysia being one of them. We also see a situation where, as I was talking earlier, the, the deep political polarization uh, in many, po many of the politics of the region, in Thailand, in Malaysia, increasingly in Indonesia, 
and you have to understand that polarization is driven by very different ideological norms, which really challenge female participation. And, and, and they similarly uh, in, uh, in, in empower toxic masculinity, which of course undermines uh, female participation. Thank you. And Dr. Lee, the same question. So traditionally, the obstacles, I cannot really surprise anyone with my answer because it's so prevalent and just so common. So one thing I can think of is electoral system, right? So even though women tend to do better in proportional representation system, the, sh the share of PR seats compared to the overall number of total seats in the parliament is so low. So for example, in Korea, 50% gender quotas for PR seats sounds amazing, until we realize the fact those PR seats are only 18% of the total seats, right? And the second um, is money, right? Money is the problem everywhere. It is hard for women to raise money because one, uh, they tend to have less access to their own um, the disposable income and also like um, raising money for their own campaign is uh, very challenging. And election takes not only elections, but uh, the political you know, activities requires legal and also sometimes illegal money. And that's something I have heard over and over when I interviewed the legislators and political candidates in, uh, in Korea and Taiwan about the money. And the third one is how I can think of um, the family ties like networks. So in, in Japan, for example, your family ties is really important to be successful to mobilize a group of voters. And those um, like family, families political um, networks are inherited to sons, not, um, not often to daughters. However, in Taiwan, at least at the local level, I heard a lot of like women, like daughters, they inherit um, family's political network. And probably that partly expla explains why Taiwanese women were more successful than uh, South Koreans or Japanese um, in their electoral, um, in their elections. So I can think of money, electoral system, and also political parties nomination practices. Thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Piscopo. Great. So what we hear from women in Latin America all the time is the political parties, the political parties, the political parties. And they talk a lot about the political parties as sort of gendered organizations, as organizations where there's a lot of discrimination and sexism. And my colleague Cecilia Josephson from Uruguay has this study, and I adore this study. I talk about it all the time. Because what she did was she talked to men and women parliamentarians in Uruguay, and she asked everyone, um, why do you think women are have less electoral chances than men? All the women said, well, you know, the leaders of the political parties are all men, they're sexist and it's all boys club. And all the men said, well, the women just aren't politically ambitious. They just don't want to do politics. So the men had a very different story that they told themselves about why women were underrepresented. And it was a story that ignored discrimination against women and placed the burden on simply women's less interest in politics. So I think that really tells us something about how those with power understand their own dominance and why it's so hard and why you need gender quotas to persuade them to step aside. Um, number two, funding as well. Although in Latin America, the situation is a little different because campaigns are often publicly financed by the state that gives the money to political parties. But of course, political parties don't necessarily divide that money evenly between men and women candidates. Although what we found in our research on Chile was that once women had won political office, once they proved themselves to be winners, they were as equally good as at attracting money as men. So it's a bit of that chicken and the egg, right? Women need to win to prove themselves. When women haven't won, they're disadvantaged. And then finally, um, political violence. And I don't just mean um, violence against women in politics, right? The sexism and harassment of women, but I mean in contexts where politics itself is violent, for instance, in Mexico, where there's a lot of incidents of organized crime into political processes, that violence itself can deter women. Women don't have the same ability to enter politics in contexts where violence is at play because women might be more responsible for their families. It's more consequential if women were to be harmed or killed. And women are vulnerable in unique ways 
to violence in contexts where violence is used as a way of negotiating political conflict. So violence itself is also a gender barrier to women's political participation. Thank you. The, well, the next question I have refers to some of the global dynamics that exist. So can you think of some global uh, factors that have entered into this question about women's progress, or maybe in some circumstances, it's their lack of progress in your regional area of concentration? And I invite any of the, the book panelists to respond. Or Dr. Lee, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I unmute it. Yeah, I can think of uh, the international norm played a very important role in South Korea and Taiwan when those two countries adopted gender quotas. So for example, in South Korea, um, the domestic um, a feminist act activists, they use this international norm to convince the powers to be, hey, we are going to be, we need to prove to the international community that we are an advanced um, country. And one of that, one of the ways to do it is to seek to show that we have higher level of gender quotas. So international norms combined with very strong nationalist um, um, enthusiasm to promote its international standing in the global uh, global politics really pushed um, helped local feminists to push the government to uh, parliaments to adopt gender quotas and the same thing goes for Taiwan so even though Taiwan is not a member state in the in the United Nations after Joe Freeman came back from Beijing after the conference in 1995 she visited Taiwan and then shared the story of gender quotas which really inspired local feminists to expand the existing gender quotas Taiwan already have. And another thing I can think of is not um, about LGBTQ rights. So Taiwan became the first in Asia in, in 20, uh, 2019 to legalize same-sex marriage. And one is because of the global norm to, uh, uh, to promote um, um, human rights for LGBTQ communities, but also because of their unique uh, situation of Taiwan as um, not being recognized by the UN as a, 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 as a state, like local local activists really said, we need to we need to show to the world that Taiwan is a gender equal, you know, promoting LGBTQ rights, and it was also another motivation for Taiwan to legalize same sex marriage. Thank you. And would either of the, the other two panelists like to weigh in? I, I was going to mention, it's really nice that the Young started on a more positive note, because I was going to talk about negative global norms. So I think it's a good balance. Um, but I wanted to speak to three. Um, uh, one is that we do see a democratic recession, a democratic decay across the world. And I think this has had a very big impact on Southeast Asian countries in terms of female participation. Uh, I've, I've mentioned the Philippines before, um, but, I, but we can see this uh, even in places such as Malaysia, uh, where we had a, a, a power grab in February of this year, last year, and we, we have a disappearance of women from the key leadership positions. I think the second thing that, that I think is important to acknowledge um, is the impact of the Trump administration. Uh, in terms of the discussion about women, the, object, uh, the way that women are, are, are described and objectified, which of course has, has had a very important impact in terms of, the, of, of facilitating similar types of open discussion that in many ways was actually uh, being curved and being, norm and, and being, being seen to be re reduced and not to be, not to be seen as acceptable. I think uh, uh, it, one of the legacies of the Trump administration is one that is actually uh, of this. And then finally, and, and connected to that, is that we've also seen in parts of Southeast Asia, especially among uh, some of the very more sexist political leaders, uh, has been you know, this kind of backlash to the Me Too movement. Uh, and I think that Me Too, in, in so many ways, uh, you know, connects in uh, into how they perceive women, how they perceive the empowerment process of women, uh, and it has actually moved the conversation away from the need to bring in electoral changes or quotas, and and is actually not been in some ways uh, it's it, it's narrowed the space. Thank you. And lastly, Dr. Piscopo. 
Yeah. What I think is fascinating about Latin America at this particular instance is it's really at the crossroads of, of two global trends. So I'll put the good and the bad together. So, you know, Latin America has, has been at the vanguard of quota adoption, as I hope I was able to convey briefly. And in some ways, it's really led the globe as a region thinking about the power of gender quotas and the gender parity to bring more women into office. Um, and so where Latin America is now is, is on the one hand in this vanguard, right? I mentioned that Chile is embarking on this amazing experiment in refounding democracy where they will seat the world's first gender parity constitutional convention and write a new constitution. Um, at the same time, we have these trends in Latin America, exactly as Dr. Welsh highlighted, about a return to strongman politics, uh, democratic backsliding, and also in Latin America, a rise of very conservative movements, conservative social movements that position themselves as against the ideology of gender. And for these groups, they are against the ideology of gender because they see um, ideas about gender equality as destabilizing traditional family roles, destabilizing traditional gender roles, where the idea of what men and women are up to is fixed. Now, these groups, um, are sort of better known for their very serious and troubling opposition to LGBTQ rights. But what's happening in Latin America is that in their opposition to LGBTQ rights, they're also rolling back gains for women's rights. So we have, for instance, 10 countries in Latin America with gender parity, but we also have a few cases where the gender quota is being stalled in converting to gender parity because the social movements that are against the so-called ideology of gender don't even want gender parity, even though gender parity doesn't touch LGBTQ rights because they simply don't want the word gender to start appearing in legislation at all. So these counter movements are really threatening some gains, not just for women's political rights, but across the board for women, girls, and LGBTQ populations. So now there's this fascinating moment. Um, half of Latin America, actually I think more than half of Latin America, will hold legislative elections in 2021. Many of those legislative elections are going to require gender parity among the candidates. But you also have a surge of right-wing parties that means you're going to have a surge of right-wing parties that are running women, conservative women, and that are adopting more of a strongman style politics and a politics opposed to multiculturalism and progressive issues. So it's going to be very fascinating to watch um, this unfold because in some ways, the, these movements are in tension with each other. Now, absolutely conservative women have a right, just like progressive women, to be represented in parliament. But it's the question of the broader movements and their opposition to human rights norms across the globe and what happens when those movements gain more seats in legislatures and even win the executive branch. Thank you very much. This has been very informative. And we will... Um, turn back to you when we begin our Q&A in a few minutes. But first I'd like to sh uh, show a short video clip of Eva Abdullah, who is a member of parliament, deputy speaker in the parliament of the Maldives. She wanted to share some of her thoughts. And so I'm just gonna share this clip quickly. Let me just directly first speak to the women in this workshop aspiring to positions of leadership or aspiring to um, work in public office or in politics. I know it's difficult. I've been there. I've been at the starting position. I know how difficult it is. You might face financial obstacles. You will face public shaming. You will face name calling. And very often all this name calling, all these insults will be gender based. You might lack family support. You're very likely to face political violence in the case of Maldives. Um, you might face even state-sponsored political violence. You might face legal persecution. You might and are very likely to face backlash from religious extremists, depending on where you're from. And it might, I know in fact that it will feel like public office is an added responsibility you cannot add on to the already existing responsibilities in the home 
and in your communities that you might already carry. You might have had tried before and not succeeded. But I want to say, keep in mind why you wanted to go into this in the first place. Keep that focus and remember that your community, that your community and your country and your societies and your parliaments and the workplaces, they need honest, strong, capable and willing women. You need to do it because if you don't do it, who will? I want to discuss a little bit about how we can break barriers that we face. We all agree that we face many barriers. How can those of us in leadership positions, how can we help those aspiring? What we need to do, I think all of us, what we need to do is continue speaking up. We need to continue raising our voices. We need to continue to advocate for legislative changes, for policy changes, for changes in how our parties choose candidates, how we fund candidates. We need to advocate for better environment, environment for women. We need to advocate for better party frameworks. We need to remain involved in affecting and advocating for these changes that we want. We need to continue to educate our male colleagues. We need to enlist, enlist them as our partners. And we have to keep, out, keep on calling out everyday sexism wherever we find it, because we need to make our workplaces and our communities a safe environment for women to work in. This provides, I think, a really excellent foundation to turn to the next um, portion of our program. I'd like to introduce you to our panelists who are from the Asian Democratic Alliance. This is an alliance of leaders and organizations in, in Asia that share a common interest in making democracy work for the people in their respective countries and the region in general. ADLA is a nonprofit organization that is open to different political beliefs and adheres to democratic values and principles. The organization aims to advance and consolidate democracy in Asia through a community of responsible and accountable civic business and political leaders, a learning and engagement platform on public policy, peace building and sustainable development, an inclusive network of organizations and groups that promote democratic leadership and governance. The Alliance envisions a society where individuals live with freedom, dignity, prosperity and peace as a result of democratic governance and leadership. Our panelists in this portion include Jargalan Bakbayar, who's vice chairwoman of the Democratic Women's Union, the women's wing of the Democratic Party of Mongolia. With more than 10 years of experience as an elected party official, she's a member of the Democratic Party's national governing party body, the National Policy Council. She has also served as the vice chairman of the Democratic Party. And most recently, she's been actively involved in redrafting the Democratic Party's charter and political manifesto. We also have with us Karen Villanueva, who first entered the arena of elected public office at the age of 23 years old as a legislator and served for two terms. She became the youngest and first female mayor of Vice City in the Philippines at the age of 29. She serves as a de development ad advisor to a provincial governor and later as an executive director for the, de for the Department of Budget. She is currently a member of the multi-sectoral advisory board. And finally, we have with us Charu Praja is from India and she's a lawyer and the first woman to head the national legal cell of the BJP's youth wing. She serves as the vice chair of the National Anti-Doping Agency's disciplinary panel and represented India as a fellow of the American Council of Young Political Leaders. So I, I have a couple of questions that I'd like to pose to the panelists. First, we'll start with um, Jargalan Bakbayar. And specifically, what has helped you to realize your own political ambitions? Hello? Hi. 
Um, yeah, good morning and good evening to everyone in this webinar. Um, it's, uh, it's late at night here in Mongolia. Um, I come from Mongolia and we've had, um, we've democratized in 1990 after almost uh, 80 years of uh, communism and the democratic wave of the 1990s was a big inspiration for us all um, as young people. And I was, um, although I wasn't even um, 10 years old back then, like I was, uh, yeah, I was seven. Um, that was a, the democratic wave, the democratization process was a big inspiration to everyone. And uh, most young people were very actively politically involved in that period. My uncles and aunts uh, went to protests. Uh, my uh, father was a big part of the uh, movement as well. So um, the, it was a generational thing, I guess, in, in a way. And um, uh, yeah, I think uh, that was one of the reasons uh, I got uh, very active politically. And um, also the lack of women in um, politics was a big driver for me as well, because, you know, uh, it kind of created more opportunities for me because people, um, once I became a member of the Democratic Party, you know, I was asked a lot to um, uh, engage more in political in the political process and then political events because I was a woman and there were kind of um, uh, not many women involved. So I think uh, that was uh, also uh, a, the lack of women, uh, although it's um, kind of weird, um, created more opportunities for me as a woman, yeah. Thank you very much. And mm -hmm. I've turned now to Karen Villanueva. What helped you realize your political ambitions? Hi, good evening to everyone or good morning. Um, pretty much um, the same uh, similarity, it has similarity with um, Charlene. Um, I first started as a, I first started helping out in the city. Um, initially, just helping out in the social cultural um, activities. Um, at that time, um, my father was a mayor and it, it, in my mind, I was just um, pitching in, um, but eventually, in the course of in the course of um, the conduct of activities and organizing, I began to see um, the the intricacy of um, relationship of inter of, of different departments in getting um, things done as simple as um, just civic. Um, uh, activities. Um, it, I then realized that um, there was more to do. Um, it helped in a way that um, it, it, there has been a generation of um, political leaders in the family. Um, it helped also that um, the lead that, that our um, grassroots leaders saw that uh, so what I did. Um, when I was just pitching in and they saw the dedication and, um, and, and um, how, how we organized things. And so um, it helped to also communicate and talk to different departments and get more perspective. And, and in the course of engagement of um, people in getting things done, um, they saw a vision that um, they wanted a voice to represent um, um, certain certain niches in the community. And so um, that was the first entry into public office. And um, um, when I first sat as a, as a legislator, as a parliamentarian, that was when I was thrown into a Pandora's box of women's issues. And um, uh, that pretty much just uh, led to engagement of more and more sectors and and getting in touch with people and getting their uh, getting to feel um, what was not necessarily deprived, but what more government could do, 
what more service could be given to uh, to to women especially um, and children and um, women themselves, women leaders in the community helped achieve an ambition that did not begin to be there but later on developed as I got involved with um, political work. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Charu. Good evening, good morning, good day to everyone. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this webinar today. My political journey started as a natural progression of my legal career. I was a practicing advocate. I was practicing in the High Court of Maharashtra. And uh, that's how I got partly involved in politics because I was doing some uh, NGO work, some nonprofit work, and slowly I got involved in some political cases. And uh, from there on, I became a part-time politician. And honestly speaking, I don't know when being a part-time politician became a full-time politician. And uh, it took over all other aspects of my life. And I'm so glad that it did. I think um, in my country, in my position, there are um, not so many ways for a woman to comfortably get into politics, but coming from a professional background definitely helps because uh, a legal background comes very handy to any political party. And uh, my work for the first three years uh, in my party was uh, limited to handling cases, usually political cases when we were in the opposition and uh, our party workers were charged with um, all sorts of uh, political sections. So uh, once it started from there, it was a natural progression to let my interest grow in other parts of politics and uh, the more in involved I got, uh, the more I started understanding that this is a system which needs full-time attention and it needs very many women. Um, we uh, do come from a country which is striving for gender equality, which is striving for gender neutrality, but we are a long way from there. Even though our current parliament has the highest number of women representation ever, it's still at 14%. So it's a very, very low number, 14%. But if you think our parliament has a low participation, our state parliaments have a participation of women as low as 8%, 9%. So um, it's not easy to be a woman in parliament politics in India. The reasons are common to many of my friends here in their countries. Patriarchy is one big reason. Uh, another very big reason is that because this entire uh, profession is dominated by so many men, women find it difficult to sustain here in a comfortable way, uh, not even talking about the family responsibility, which falls upon only a woman in a traditional society. That being said, uh, we have made some inroads. There has been space that has has been created for people like me who don't even come from very typical political backgrounds, but it's an uphill climb. It's still an uphill climb and every single day when you're striving to get a new position in the party, I think you have to prove yourself again and again. Uh, I want to repeat one discussion I had with a fellow lady politicians and it, it's left an impact on my mind. Many a times political parties help women advance because they want to look good in the books, because they want to look good with statistics and numbers, and they want to show that they have a lot of women past participation, it's often not uh, the whole truth, because you might have a figurehead, which you're putting on all your party posters, but when you look at representation across all stratas of your party, it's going to tell you another different story. And even though we have many regional parties in my country, which are led by women, which have also given India uh, uh, lady chief ministers, even these political parties don't really encourage a lot of women participation in politics. And there are a whole lot of reasons uh, for this. We could get into more details about this. Uh, the uh, interesting point to note here is that even though more than 700 women were given tickets to contest parliamentary elections for the general elections this time, only 78 of them won. So it's one thing to say that our participation of women in parliament is really high this time in comparison to all the previous parliaments. The number of women who are in a winnable position still remains low and the reasons for that is uh, our uh, society. So till we don't advance as a society, till we don't address gender equality as a society, 
society fielding women candidates is not going to give us very good representation in parliament we have to field winnable winnable candidates as well and we have to work on ground interesting to note that out of these 700 odd women which were fielded for uh, elections 45% of them came from political families they had political connections in their families so um, it's uh, fairly easy to say that even though 700 might have participated only 78 won and out of all of these most of them half of them definitely had political connections thank you all i wondered if you could give if there was one piece of advice that you would like to give a a person a woman who's thinking about a political career what would you what would you say what would be one piece of advice that you would like her to consider any of the the panelists yes um so i'd like to give my piece of advice to all the young women who want to be a part of the political process in their countries one find a cause don't be a general politician always have a cause which is very close to your heart because that's going to stay with you and that's going to take you really really far in your country and uh, my second piece of advice is after you found your cause please be consistent with it and stick to it even if you wake up certain mornings feeling that you're not making any progress if you wake up certain mornings feeling like giving up don't do that because this is a profession where your passion will pay but your consistency will pay even more Thank you. And either Karen or Dragalan, what what piece of advice would you give to a woman who's thinking about a political career? Um, yeah, on top of Charo's advice, uh, finding a cause is, of course, uh, a must. Um, I would say um, pay your dues at the at your political party because um, political the political work starts with your party. in your community and i think paying your dues at that level is um, is a big component of how far your political career, career is going to advance in the future because um, political parties are gatekeepers to the political process and um, i would say that um, just to give uh, a little bit a little bit more information about mongolia's uh, uh, gender um equality uh situation i would say that um although mongolia is seen as a, a kind of um a more westernized uh, uh, as having a more westernized culture compared to uh uh to the to many other uh east asian countries uh, mongolia's uh, gender uh representation in the parliament and uh, the higher echelons of government is still very much lacking. Uh, today we currently have um, 13 women in parla- in the parliament of 76 uh, parliamentarians. So that's uh, uh, um, that's like 17% um, female representation in the parliament. And today uh, a, a new cabinet was sworn in and we got uh, four female ministers out of uh, 16 cabinet ministers and that's the most ever so although we do have a culture of this uh, of uh, a culture of uh, gender neutral uh, not very patriarchal culture uh, we still struggle with this class ceiling that we have um, at the highest uh, level in politics and um, i would say that um, we uh introduced gender quotas in 2012 uh we have a first past the post system uh electoral system here in mongolia and we introduced gender quotas in t- 2012 with um uh, but the gender quota was only 20% and so that has become a glass ceiling in itself because political parties would only um uh nominate 20% women So what I I have personally been doing um uh was um uh, in my work uh on the uh on our party's constitution you know we tried to lobby for increasing this gender con- uh, uh this gender quota in our party's constitution because we don't have a lot of um leverage over the uh legislation because currently our party is in uh opposition so we've been trying to uh 
rewrite the party constitution, uh, constitution uh, with a view towards gender parity. So um, again, uh, I would say that starting your political work within the party within, is a must for any young aspiring politician. Yeah, thank you. Finally, Karen, what advice would you give someone considering a political career? Your mic. Do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, especially in this forum, I would say be comfortable being a woman. Um, a lot of the leadership roles really are, are uh, would put that to a test. Um, and so I would break that, I would break that council into two parts, first as a person and then and, and as a leader, because there is always a person in that leadership uh, position. As a person, as I said, be comfortable, being, be comfortable being a woman. Know yourself. Know your boundaries. Someone's always going to test it. Um, if you know yourself, you know what you can give and you know what you cannot and would not give. Um, so when somebody tests it, you would know what to do, um, especially if you are young um, in a very male-dominated field. Someone will always test it. I've had the opportunity to um, be a legislator and be part of the bureaucracy as a stateswoman, you may, if you may, um, and also take on an executive role. And that for me is when um, your femininity would come into either play or in question because most of leadership roles um, in a room full of men of executives, you have to make your stance as white as a man. But um, you don't exact, you don't necessarily have to take on to, to be as masculine as they are. You can still be yourself. Um, I would say um, be open to grow. You don't necessarily have to, as I said, uh, be a man to fulfill a seemingly male role, um, but you can grow and fashion um, your style of leadership. Um, imprint um, a woman's touch in leadership role. Um, be comfortable having feelings or feeling more as a woman. Um, use that emotional intelligence to craft if you are in parliamentary or legislative leadership. Use that, uh, use that emotional intelligence to make um, policies more responsive. If you are aspiring for an executive role, use that emotional intelligence to, to choose responsive courses of action. Um, as a woman in that leadership role, as a leader, um, engage more people. Um, use that emotional intelligence to talk to people, um, to know where they are, what they need, um, it is okay not to know everything. One does not know everything. Leadership does not mean knowing everything. Leadership means listening, especially to those that you mean to lead. Um, and as you engage more and more people, you will be bombarded with competing priorities and different needs find the middle ground of course always take into your heart the centerpiece those at the fringes find the middle ground and craft the necessary um, actions that must be taken to address the common needs but um, create innovate programs that will bring into the fold those that are at the fringes so engage as many people i find that the most um um, unfiltered uh, preview that I would have into the households of the community are the children. And so I would make time to talk to the children and ask them what it is like at home. Um, in a way, I get to see if, if the policies that I decided on, and I'm talking as an executive, if the policies, um, the programs that we are doing in the city are, 
are felt in the households. Um, that is the, of course, the basic units of the of, of every community, and um, the children are of course uh, the most vulnerable. And so I find it very useful to find time to talk to them, and to know um, based on that um, based on that uh, conversation, based on that clean into the household, I would know how to calibrate my programs. Um, to make it more responsive in a very unique way to the dynamics, uh, the culture of, of the city that I led. Um, another would be uh, be decisive, um, decide. Calibrate, of course, always calibrate. Calibrate the risks that you're gonna take because lives are at stake, especially if you are in an executive position where a stroke of a pen, even in, in, in legislature, um, Within a stroke of a pen, lives, you can make or break lives. Um, but decide. It is okay um, to take risks. It's depending on the calibrated risk. Um, it is some, it is to a certain degree okay to make mistakes. No leader is perfect. There is no mold of a perfect leader that we can just pass on and 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 take on. Um, and in each community, each each challenge is always different from the other. And if there was an already answer, then you know, we, we, we could have just copied it. Um, and, and mentioning that as a leader, as a woman leader, um, copy, as a leader, copy. It is okay to copy. It's, it's, it's only in schools that we're not allowed to copy, but as a leader, I would encourage copy and innovate. There is always someone out there um, probably facing or has already addressed similar issues that you are facing. But of course, um, pay attention, pay close attention to the dynamics that you have in your own community, the culture, because strategy eats culture. Um, but as you copy, you, you innovate. That is, when, um, that is when your individuality comes out. Um, but on that note also, uh, as a leader, it is tempting for us to be available for everyone, to make ourselves uh, available, especially as women. Um, we must keep in mind that we cannot be everything for everyone and still be true to ourselves. And that's where the boundaries come in. Um, then I have to say this. Um, it, it doesn't matter if, if we are women or not, but in leadership positions, and especially probably as women, it is lonely on top, but that is the nature of leadership. And there will be many, many times that you will be tested. And it, like in my experience, my father was mayor, but it did not matter how many other previous leaders or mayors we have in the family, the box stops with you. And you're the one who makes, who has to make that decision. Show up, um, show up. Um, and that means being prepared. That means having done the work, um, being agile, listening, asking for help. Um, we, as leaders, calm. We should calm more crises than we create. And sometimes there are certain points, there are certain instances in a leadership role where absence of emotions is necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we are going to move to the question and answer portion. For attendees, if you have a question you'd like the panelists to address, feel free to um, type it in the chat box. We do have um, questions already. One is, I'm just gonna read it verbatim, often in the US, it seems that when women say things, especially identifying gaps and wrongs, we're more likely to be criticized for being whiny or such. When we take steps to support our programs or our opportunities, um, we're told we're not allowed to stand up. On the other hand, men are able to say what they want to whomever they want without criticism. Do gender parity rules help women get the same opportunities? I'm going to ask Dr. Piscopo about this and she's going to have to be leaving soon. Thanks so much for that question. You know, the short answer is unfortunately no. I mean, I think, you know, what, what gender parity does is it creates a formal structure 
where um, women have to be elected or appointed. And um, as long as you're in a context where those legal rules are followed and there's sanctions for actors when they do not, then the, the rules are respected. But you know what gender quotas or gender parity aren't going to do is sort of eliminate everyday sexism or hostile sexism. I mean, that's the real hard work of cultural change. And you know, for thinking about this idea of um, you know, women are women are told to stop asking, right? So the event that I'm moving to now is, is about Chile's gender parity constitutional convention and the election um, authorities in Chile actually approved some candidate lists that didn't follow the gender parity rules. And the women are complaining actively right now before the election authorities. And a, a colleague of mine in, in Chile went on national television in Chile to talk about their complaint. And the newscaster was sort of like, well, what are you ladies complaining about? You know, why does it, who cares that a few lists didn't follow the rules? Why are you still asking for more? And so this, you know, so even in a context where um, Chile is literally setting a global standard, um, there's still this sense of if the women are raising their voices to say it's not being done right or it's not being done perfectly, you know, they're sort of whiny brats. And so I think that um, we should continue to fight for these rules. And I'm really proud of the women who are still going on television and, and facing that sexism and demanding that the rules be respected. Um, but we, we need to realize that just because we have the gender parity in place is not the end of the story. It's a deeply important part um, and it, it's hard. Those who are marginalized are always going to have to face um, more and more criticism and more and more backlash when they continue to ask for what's right. Um, and you know, in doing this for 20 years, I haven't found a way around that um, except to really draw inspiration from all the women politicians and parliamentarians, including those who joined us today, who just tell us to, to keep fighting because it's worth it. Thank you, that was an excellent response to a very interesting question. And I received another question about, well, how do you, how do you become politically active if you lack the finances and if you lack the experience? What, what could somebody in that position do? I think that was something that held a lot of the regional stories together was this pointing to the, the obstacles that are presented with the financial situation. So, so what do you do? How do you, how do you address that? Anybody in the panel? Yes, Charu. Thank you. I feel I'm uh, slightly equipped to answer this because I got into politics without planning it, absolutely without planning it. And I jumped my career midway. I think we should make use of all the tools that we have at hand, which people didn't have at hand a decade ago, which means uh, use social media very, very extensively. Put your voice out there and uh, learn to tag the correct people. So with tools like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you're able to put your voice out there, even though a newspaper or a TV channel or media might not want to cover you the conventional way. And the more you write about your opinions, the more people who start following you, the more influential you will be, and it'll be uh, quicker to get into active and uh, mainstream politics. And that has helped a lot of people in my country because we've seen in the last four or five years, many leaders emerge from the grassroots by only using the tools of social media and use it very wisely. So uh, that's the first thing that I want to say. If you're in the right place and you are able to amplify your voice and you are able to work with four or five loyal followers who can uh, put together a graphic design, who can make a nice video of you speaking, who can write a nice speech for you, I don't think you need to be spending a lot of money to become popular very quickly. That's one of the advantages of social media. There are many disadvantages as well, but that's one thing that works in our favor. Thank you so much. We also have a question about what difference does it make to have women in positions of power? How would they, how would you identify maybe some specific benefits to including women in, in political institutions? Anyone? I'll start, and I'm sure there are others that can join in. Um, I, I think that uh, it, it's sad, this is the question also that Jennifer would have been able to answer. Um, but I would say there, there are two or, three, two or three things that we can see. 
Number one, um, we see that the agenda changes in terms of the issues that are broached. So we see, for example, attention to healthcare, the issues about uh, family, uh, that uh, there is actually a kind of more inclusive agenda in terms of policy making. By bringing more women in, it also brings attention to the issues that women are interested in, but also that affect the family as a whole. A second, another arena where we see real changes is in the way politics can take, is carried out. Women are bridges and, and that they can often uh, basically move between uh, some of the politics that is highly confrontational and polarized, in part because they're not seen as, as threatening. And also they operate in a very different way. They're focused, they're, traditionally they're more consensus oriented and that actually, uh, not to say that there aren't women that are confrontational, there are, but the fact of the matter is, is that the politics can't, does shift and change. Um, and a third important feature is that traditionally, and again, there are always exceptions, um, what we do find is that women in politics help to increase the integrity of politics because there is a perceived to have less corruption for women politicians than men. Uh, now, there are, this trend is changing and women are joining the corruption train, unfortunately, but the fact of the matter is, is that uh, um, this has actually been a scene as change, making the, pol the political process and governance process with higher levels of integrity. Um, we, we see consistently surveys across the regions and across the world that women are seen to be more responsive, more hardworking, and less corrupt as politicians in, in the field. Um, and this, of course, has an important impact in terms of the quality of governance. These are just some of the preliminary areas. I'm sure the young politicians and will have a lot more to share uh, in this area. Thank you. We have a question that came in um, addressing the politicians. What was the most challenging situation you have ever encountered as a political leader and how did you resolve it? Anyone? Yes, Karen? Yeah. Um, having a difficulty deciding which one is the most challenging. Um, I would say in the beginning of, um, in the beginning of, uh, of my leadership as an executive, I felt that I was most challenged um, in terms of security. Being very young and the first female chief executive of the city, um, I felt that there were contentions as to whether I would be able to provide, um, yeah, to maintain the peace and order and just basically uh, protect the city um, from invasion, if any. And uh, in the beginning of my term in the first, especially in the first, in the first six months, there was um, a series of unrelated um, incidences that was happening in the hinterlands in the Philippines, uh, especially in my city. Um, we, have, um, we have mountains that are not as easy accessible that we are still trying to uh, make roads towards. And so there is a tendency um, for insurgency, although um, Ba'is, uh, at that time, had uh, the crime incidence of the city was 0.05%, but we did have insurgency happening in, in the mountains of our, of our neighboring towns and neighboring um, cities. And so they would traverse and go through the mountains of, of my jurisdiction. And, and for a time, it concerned um, people living in certain barangays um, as to the ability of the city to provide security and and so um, I could not change the fact that I was a woman and I could not change the fact that I was very young especially could I not change the fact that I am relatively small in size and so um, to get around this I I took a more active role in in designing uh, tactical training for our um, law enforcers, for the policemen, um, 
equipping uh, our uh, our policemen to be able to respond should there be a need to neighboring cities and of course protecting uh, the ones that live in our city. Uh, I took a and, 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 and this can also add to the previous question. Uh, generally, as women, we, we tend to be more proactive. We do not wait for, for things to blow up in our face, and then we scramble for, for solutions. And while there was that concern, which was not exactly um, a campaign for uh, government reform or, or counterinsurgency, but um, I, I could see that that particular series of unrelated events might eventually lead people in the hinterlands to think that uh, the city government or the government for that matter could not protect them. And as I saw that potential, I went in and calibrated steps. Uh, I, I envisioned um, a probable um, incident and broke it down into actionable steps of action, uh, actionable points. Um, with calibrated effort and very, uh, very, uh, I would say it, 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 it required, um, it required being, getting in touch with my tactical side. And so um, we were able to present to the people of PICE that they may have had, they, they may have at that time, um, young and female and as I said by, by, by structure I, I'm rather small but I am able to operate tactically as a leader you're needed for your vision and not always your action and and so we were able to put, project a position of strength that we can defend uh, our city with the resources that we have and the ability to um, foresee uh, potential threats and um, calibrate preparatory actions. Thank you very much. And we um, are going to now turn to the closing where I invite Mega, Mika Sarma to offer some closing remarks. She's the research officer Regional Program and Political Dialogue in Asia for the Conrad Abnauer Foundation. And she's been an immense, um, I don't even, this is just putting it mildly, she's been a great help to the whole process, not only with the book project, but also with organizing this very uh, presentation panel today. So thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, Farida. Uh, a good evening to all in America. Uh, so good evening to all in Asia, and a good morning to all in America. Good morning to all in America. It has been a really a big pleasure to have this enriching discussion of our book. Uh, we have always the Conrad Adenauer Foundation has always tried to put the women empowerment agenda forward by providing platforms for networking and exchange. The book is just an example of that. We have a lot of other activities please do visit our website as well as download a copy of the book to learn more about it. I would like to thank all the panelists, Bridget, uh, Youngin, Farida, and uh, uh, Jennifer for participating in here. And a big thank you to our Adla members to stay up this late. It's really late in Asia at the moment to stay up and share their experiences. And uh, thank you, Farida, for giving us this uh, opportunity to share our work. It was really, really, it was very interesting for us, and we really enjoyed every minute of it. Last and not, but last but not the least, I would like to thank my team members who were not able to join us today, and also our director and my co-editor, Mr. Krishna Ashley. Thank you so much, and thank you to all for participating. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you to all of the panelists that have taken time out of their busy schedules to present today and address your questions. Um, I really had a fantastic time learning more about your careers and your research agendas in the foundation. Um, I would love if we can somehow stay in touch. We will be posting this um, panel on various uh, platforms. And so watch out for that and Thanks again. And for those who just woke up recently, have a great day. For those who have been up all day and need to go to bed, have a great night. 
And I hope that everybody takes care. And thank you for the panel, for not just the panelists, but also the attendees who joined us from all over the world. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night.